Welcome, everyone. Uh, we're sorry for uh, some technical difficulties, but we're going to go ahead because we have a, a wonderful panel of speakers, and uh, you're a wonderful patient audience across the country. Hundreds of people are joining us online. So let me share with you uh, a welcome and introduction. My name is Michael Morris. I am the co-policy uh, co-chair of the policy team for the LEAD Center, funded by ODEP, Office of Disability Employment Policy, U.S. Department of Labor. This is the part four of a four-part series on the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act. Uh, this is the uh, segment that we are going to focus on Section 188, the non-discrimination and equal opportunity provisions. And uh, let me uh, share with you first a little background about the LEAD Center, if you've never been on one of our webinars. LEAD stands for the National Center on Leadership for the Employment and Economic Advancement of People with Disabilities. It's a collaborative of disability, workforce, and economic empowerment organizations. It's led by the National Disability Institute with many uh, co-partner public and private agencies. We are funded by the U.S. Department of Labor's Office of Disability Employment Policy, or known as ODEP. We are uh, in our uh, third year of uh, a five-year funding period, and let me share with you the mission of the LEAD Center. It is to advance sustainable individual and systems-level change that results in improved, competitive, integrated employment and economic self-sufficiency outcomes for individuals across the spectrum of disability. You can visit our very large and robust website uh, at www.leadcenter.org. Today, uh, we have, a, uh, as I mentioned, a great a group of uh, speakers, presenters. I want to review with you the webinar outcomes. I want to uh, let you know that you're going to have an opportunity to learn from uh, people who are very, very engaged in the workforce development system at a federal, state, and local level. We're going to have an opportunity for questions. We will try to give uh, uh, strong answers to you and uh, we will end with some final thoughts. Well, what are the outcomes we hope for from this webinar? Uh, we hope that you uh, will increase your awareness, understanding, and knowledge about the critical elements of Section 188 of the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act. We will share with you as well promising practices within the newly released this summer Section 188 Disability Reference Guide. We will also help you understand better the relationship between Section 188 and the overall act as in terms of disability-related provisions. And then finally, we're going to share with you uh, state and local perspectives on improving access and equal opportunity for job seekers uh, with disabilities. So let me share with you uh, who we have brought together to talk about Section 188. Our first speaker will be Chris Button. She is the Supervisor, Workforce System Policy at the Office of Disability Employment Policy, U.S. Department of Labor. She has over 25 years of experience working with um, disability service delivery systems and public policy across um, the, the, the full spectrum of the federal government. She spent years on Capitol Hill as well in policy development. So we're, we're glad Chris is joining us. Uh, we also will have with us Lee Persily. He is the senior policy advisor at the Civil Rights Center of the U.S. Department of Labor. Previous to his recent engagement at CRC, the Civil Rights Center, Lee served as the Disability Counsel uh, for 10 years, for 10 years with Senator Tom Harkin, who is now retired, but was the chair of the Senate Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee, or HELP Committee, which of course was the principal players in the drafting and passage 
of WIOA, the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act. He also worked on the ADA Amendments Act and many other pieces of legislation impacting individuals with disabilities. We will also be joined by Laura Ibanez, who serves as the Unit Chief for the Employment and Training Administration's uh, National Program Unit at the Department of Labor. She is in the unit that's uh, focused on national farm workers' job programs, uh, monitor advocate system, disability employment initiative, or DEI, and the Work Opportunity Tax Credits Program. Before joining recently ETA, she was involved on policy issues impacting people with disabilities on the youth team at ODEP, Office of Disability Employment Policy. We also will be joined by Lisa Stern, the Employment Policy Advisor for the LEAD Center. Lisa has more than 25 years of experience working inside the workforce development system and uh, outside working on many initiatives that impact employment and economic advancement for people across the spectrum of disabilities with a particular emphasis in her work on, on assisting injured service members and veterans re-enter the civilian workforce. She has also spent a, a great deal of time focused on youth with disabilities, transitioning from school to work, and adults with disabilities accessing the services of the public workforce system. From the state of Missouri, we are going to be joined by Danielle Smith. She is the State Equal Opportunity Officer for the State Division of Workforce Development within the Department of Economic Development, and she's been in that position for almost 10 years. And then finally, from a local or community level, we are going to be joined by Mike Holmes. Mike is the Executive Director of the St. Louis Agency on Training and Employment. He was appointed by Mayor Francis Slay. Slate, as it's known, this St. Louis Agency is the responsible agency for the uh, management and implementation of job training, uh, employment and career advancement services for people with and without disabilities, job seekers in the city of St. Louis. He brings uh, over 20 years of experience in higher education and nonprofit work, and uh, he uh, is someone who will help us understand these issues of 188 from the, uh, from the community level where we uh, obviously touch people directly with and without disabilities. And so um, this is, is quite a panel, and I am pleased to be able to uh, bring this group to you on behalf of the LEAD Center. So let's um, start uh, by, uh, before we turn to our first speaker, let me take it back to Nakia, who will just go over some logistics and technical issues around participating in this uh, webinar. Thank you, Michael, and good afternoon, everyone. The audio for today's webinar is being broadcast through your computer. Please make sure that your speakers are turned on and turned up or that your headphones are plugged in. You can control the audio broadcast via the audio broadcast panel. If you accidentally close this panel, you can reopen it by going to the menu at the top, Communicate, and choosing Join Audio Broadcast. Next slide, please. If you do not have sound capabilities on your computer or if you prefer to listen by phone, you can dial the toll or toll-free number that you see here and enter the meeting code. Please note that you do not need to enter an attendee ID. Next slide, please. Real-time captioning is provided during this webinar. The captions can be found in the Meteor Viewer Panel, which appears in the lower right-hand corner of the webinar platform. If you'd like to make the media viewer panel larger, you can do so by minimizing some of the other panels like chat or Q&A. And conversely, if you do not need the captions, you can minimize the media viewer panel. Next slide, please. We will have time for questions at the end of the webinar. Please use the chat box or the Q&A box to send any questions you have during the webinar to me, Nakia Matthews, or to Brittany Taylor, and we will direct those questions accordingly at the end of the webinar. If you're listening by phone and not logged into the webinar, you may also ask questions by email 
by emailing me, Nakia, at nmatthews at ndi-inc.org. Please note that this webinar is being recorded and the materials will be placed on the Lead Center website at the URL you see here. If you experience any technical difficulties during the webinar, please use the chat box to send me a message, or you may also email me at nmatthews at ndi-inc.org. And to all of our panelists today, could you please say next slide as you're doing your presentations. We're having a little bit of technical difficulties here, so we're kind of having to do a workaround. So Elizabeth Jennings will be moving the slides for everyone today. So again, when it's your turn to speak, just say next slide when you're ready to move on. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Nakia. Um, let me provide a context for this webinar. This is Michael Morris again the uh, co-team chair of uh, public policy for the LEAD Center, also the executive director of the National Disability Institute. Next slide, please. As I said, this is the fourth of a four-part series. We began back in February, February 25th, with a general overview of the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act. Uh, that webinar and uh, had great presenters from uh, ETA, Employment and Training Administration, and Office of Disability Employment Policy. That webinar is archived for you on the LEAD Center website. Next slide, please. The second uh, uh, part of this series, we move from a general overview to looking at the unified state planning process. That webinar took place on April 29th and inc included, again, people within the workforce development system, uh, as well as uh, not just the federal level, but we also had people on from uh, D.C. government, from multiple agencies, vocational rehabilitation, workforce development system, education, to really have a better understanding of how might this unified state planning process uh, play out uh, the remainder of this year and into next year. Next slide. Part three was the webinar on understanding changes regarding youth services. And here again, we had an opportunity to understand this at a national perspective, and then we had an opportunity to learn about what does this mean at a state and community level. So this part four, um, again, encompasses a piece of WIOA, Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act, that uh, is not focused by population, is not focused on one aspect of the act, but actually is it's, it's uh, protection against discrimination and equal opportunity provisions that cuts across uh, multiple vulnerable populations uh, in terms of protection and equal opportunity, including people with disabilities. So to get us uh, started on this uh, webinar, focusing on Section 188, let me turn it back to Chris Button, uh, with the Office of Disability Employment Policy. Chris? Thank you so much, Michael. I'm going to ask um, uh, that two slides be advanced so that we are looking at a slide that says diversity of job seekers because when we think about the public workforce system, kind of the umbrella of the public workforce system, that is what we are talking about. The American Jobs Center system is serving customers who are low-skilled, low-wage, disconnected, disadvantaged, and at risk with multiple employment challenges, many of whom have hidden disabilities. So this um, whole idea of the importance of 188, uh, as we at ODEP were working with our colleagues at the Civil Rights Center, CRC, and ETA, the Employment and Training Administration, um, we thought it was really appropriate, given the enactment of WIOA, to really think um, really deeply about Section 188 and how we can support AJCs and states to serve the full range of diversity of job seekers that come to their centers. And as you see on the next slide, universal access is the way that we thought um, we should approach this, um, this whole area. That, that looking at um, embedding within the job centers 
and the extended partners of the, um, the workforce invest, uh, development system, um, the concept of universal access where the services and strategies that are used are really useful not just to people with disabilities but to the full range of diversity, particularly people who have complex issues in their life and are really looking for assistance from the job centers as they try to um, seek employment. So the next slide um, reiterates that on July 6th of this year, Secretary of Labor Tom Perez released Promising Practices in Achieving Universal Access and Equal Opportunity, a Section 188 Disability Reference Guide. This guide was jointly developed by CRC, by ETA, the Employment and Training Administration, by ODEP, with support and assistance from our Lead Technical Assistance Center, uh, Michael Morris and some of his staff over at the National Disability Institute. And um, the intent was to actually update a 188 checklist that was issued over a, a decade ago that we came together as partner agencies within the Department of Labor and decided it was time to take a fresh look at that checklist to see what additional things have we learned as a result of the, the many investments that the Department of Labor has made within the public workforce system over the last decade, really, around building capacity to serving people with dis disabilities so that the job centers can, in fact, provide meaningful and effective services to that broad group of individuals. And so what we did was we, um, we took kind of a three-part research approach to collecting the information that we wanted to pull together about really uh, great strategies, best practice approaches that were being implemented within the AJCs across the, the nation as a result of some of those investments, investments like the Disability Navigator Initiative, the Disability Employment Initiative, the Customized Employment Grants, the Youth Intermediary Grants. There were a number of initiatives targeting the um, AJCs that uh, we knew we would be able to learn from as a way of updating the checklist that was issued so many years ago. And so we, um, we went to CRC and we actually reviewed and read um, the um, methods of administration that are required to be submitted by the state, uh, which is their plan really for implementing Section 188. We went to NASWA, the National Association of State Workforce Agencies, to their EO, their Equal Opportunity Committee and ask um, for some outreach to select states to gather um, ideas from the EO officers about, uh, and others in the states about um, strategies that they have been implementing that have been particularly successful. And significantly, we also went to our Disability Employment Initiative grants, our DEI grants, who are jointly funded by the Employment and Training Administration and by ODEP specifically to build capacity for youth and adults with disabilities in the American Job Centers. And through those multiple prongs of information collection, we collected a lot of information and strategies that are currently being implemented in the state. And then our goal was to put them together in a way that would be most useful and readily accessible to people who are involved uh, with the system and, and making the system universally accessible to their job seekers. And on the next slide, you'll see that uh, while the reference guide focuses specifically on the American Job Center system, it's also really a useful resource for governors, for state administrators, state workforce agencies, equal opportunity officers, and state and local workforce development agencies, and that is because of the, the umbrella concept of universal design that has built, been built into it. It's not just for people with disabilities, it's for people trying to access the system so that the system itself uh, in a universal way can um, provide these good inclusive practices and, and thus make their doors and their services open to everyone. 
So Lee's going to be talking a little bit more about the organization and the examples within the reference guide. Um, I'll just say quickly that on the next slide, there is a part one and a part two. Part one contains a range of examples that highlight some of the ways that the job centers can meet their legal obligations. And those are broken out into three different sections, universal access, equal opportunity, and governance implementation. Part two contains the actual language from current Section 188 regulations, and those really were kind of the, the basis of the um, promising practices. You can also, uh, you will also find that there are hyperlinks in that section two that will take you directly to the regulations so that you can go back and forth from the guide to the regulations to the practices in a way that's hopefully very usable to you as someone who's trying to get a, a better sense of the strategies that have been um, put forward in the guide. The next slide um, says that um, the, uh, it's just kind of reiterating the fact that the guide does not create any kind of new legal requirements. It doesn't change current legal requirements. It doesn't preclude states from thinking of other things that they can do that might not be in the guide already. In fact, the intent is that the guide is going to be a living document. We will continue to identify best practice strategies and include them, add them to the guide as we continue to move forward with additional capacity building activities and as the states continue to inform us about the innovative things that they are finding successful. And finally, adoption of these promising practices that are in the guide are not going to guarantee compliance. Um, what they will do is go, go a long way towards ensuring um, that the programs are, in fact, accessible to and usable by a full range of job seekers, including youth and adults with disabilities. Michael, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Thanks, Chris. Um, that certainly helps people to understand that uh, not only do we have Section 188, but uh, it, it has a pretty broad umbrella reach, as you said. And uh, what's remarkable about the reference guide uh, effort was it, it was a collaborative effort, Civil Rights Center, ETA, and ODEP. So to hear next, uh, we will hear from Lee Persley, Senior Policy Advisor of the Civil Rights Center, who will provide us with uh, some further understanding uh, about what is Section 188 and promising practices. Lee? Thank you, Michael. Hi, everyone. I'm going to start out by talking a little bit about what Section 188 is and then who Section 188 applies to before we get into the more spe specifics about the, the uh, resource guide and some practical examples. Uh, next slide, please. So what is Section 188? So Section 188 implements the non-discrimination and equal opportunity provisions of WIOA, which are contained, ironically enough, in Section 188 of the statute. Section 188 prohibits discrimination on the grounds of race, color, religion, sex, national origin, age, disability, political affiliation or belief, among other bases. Section 188 also requires that reasonable accommodations be provided to qualified individuals with disabilities in certain circumstances. Section 188 of WIOA contains provisions identical to those in Section 188 of WIA. And the regulations for Section 188 of WIOA can be found at 29 CFR Part 38. Next slide, please. So who does Section 188 apply to? Um, if you're interested, I put the uh, regulatory sections at the top if you want to look them up for yourselves. But in general, Section 188 applies to recipients who are defined as any entity to which state financial assistance under WIOA Title I is extended, including state-level agencies that administer or are financed by WIOA Title I funds, state employment security agencies, state and local workforce investment boards, one-stop operators, service providers, including eligible training providers, on-the-job training employers, and 
Job Corps contractors and center operators, excluding federally operated Job Corps centers. Section 188 also applies to programs and activities that are part of the one-stop delivery system that are operated by one-stop partners. Next slide, please. So while the reference guide addresses the equal opportunity provisions of, of the Section 188 regulations, which ensure equal opportunity for individuals with disabilities, it's important to remember that recipients may also be subject to the requirements of other laws, such as Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act, which prohibits discrimination against individuals with disabilities by recipients of federal financial assistance. Also. Title I of the ADA, which prohibits discrimination and employment based on disability, and Title II of the ADA, which prohibits state and local governments from discriminating on the basis of disability. I'm assuming everybody knows that ADA means the Americans with, Dis the Americans with Disabilities Act. Next slide, please. For the purposes of the reference guide, the term individual with a disability is the same as the ADA definition, which means an individual with a disability is an individual with a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities of such individual, an individual who has a record of such an impairment, or an individual who is regarded as having such an impairment. Next slide, please. So let's talk a little bit about reasonable accommodations. So under Section 188, covered entities are required to provide reasonable accommodations for individuals with disabilities to ensure equal access and opportunity. The term reasonable accommodations is defined in the Section 188 regulations as modifications or adjustments to an application or registration process that enables a qualified applicant or registrant with a disability to be considered for the aid, benefits, services, training, or employment that the qualified applicant or registrant desires, that enable a qualified individual with a disability to perform the essential functions of a job or to receive aid, benefits, services, or training equal to that provided to qualified individuals without disabilities or that enable a qualified individual with a disability to enjoy the same benefits and privileges of the aid, benefits, services, training, or employment as are enjoyed by other similarly situated individuals without disabilities. For those of you that are knowledgeable about the concept of reasonable accommodation, this is pretty standard stuff. Next slide, please. In addition, under Section 188, covered entities are also required to ensure that individuals with disabilities have equal opportunity to access their programs, benefits, and activities. Equal opportunity includes prohibiting discrimination against individuals with disabilities, <clears throat> providing reasonable accommodations or reasonable modifications of policies practices and procedures for individuals with disabilities, using the same processes for all customers, including individuals with disabilities, for select selecting participants in all programs, administering programs in the most integrated setting appropriate, ensuring effective communication, including providing auxiliary aids and services where necessary, and providing programmatic and architectural accessibility. Now, it's important to note that the reference to the term programmatic accessibility as part of Section 188 is new in WIOA. Programmatic accessibility includes, among other things, providing assistive technology devices and services where necessary to afford individuals with disabilities an equal opportunity to participate in and enjoy the benefits of the program or activity. When you think about programmatic accessibility, which is mentioned 10 times in the WIOA statute, 
it's important to remember that programmatic accessibility is very different from the old ADA term of program accessibility. Um, programmatic accessibility is a term that was um, uh, put together by congressional staff as a way to denote a specific ability to provide access to the services that one finds um, at the one stops and other 188 entities <clears throat> that include, for example, as we talked about, um, reasonable accommodations, reasonable modifications, etc. So in a lot of places in, as I said, 10 places exactly, in the statute, there are references to compliance with section 188, comma, including physical and programmatic accessibility. So programmatic accessibility includes all of those other equal opportunity provisions that we've just talked about in addition to physical accessibility. Next slide. So now we're going to talk a little bit about some promising practices. And the 188 reference guide is full of examples of promising practices. And I'm just going to talk about a few of them today. But I really encourage everybody who's on this webinar to take a look at the 188 guide because it has some extraordinary information about compliance. As Chris Button said, the guide was written with an eye towards the AJCs, but in reality, as she also said, um, it, it can apply to lots of other different entities um, within the purview um, of the 188 covered entities um, to ensure their accessibility for individuals with disabilities. So again, I encourage all of you to take a look at the 188 guide. There's a link posted up on uh, DOL website, on the CRC website. Um, and it's posted other places, and I'm sure uh, Michael and others will, uh, will um, also let folks know um, the best way to find it. So let's talk a little bit about some examples of promising practices. So as we talked about, one of the uh, tenets of equal opportunity is prohibiting discrimination. Prohibiting discrimination uh, includes covered entities rejecting all job offers from employers that will not accept applications from individuals with disabilities. Covered entities that do not stereotype individuals with disabilities when evaluating their skills, abilities, interests, and needs. Covered entities that select locations that are accessible and ideally near a public transportation system. And covered entities that regularly review eligibility criteria for training and other services to eliminate discriminatory criteria. Again, these are examples of promising practices in the area of prohibiting discrimination and ensuring equal opportunity. Next slide, please. So let's talk a little bit about some promising practices in providing reasonable accommodations. <clears throat> so covered entities in providing reasonable accommodations would do well to have a written reasonable accommodation policy in place, including processes for handling requests for reasonable accommodations, training and information regarding the processes. <clears throat> excuse me, of identifying and providing reasonable accommodations, including a description of the interactive process between staff and the individual with a disability that begins when an individual requests a reasonable accommodation. I'm sure many of you know that an important aspect of the reasonable accommodation provision is that interactive process between staff and the individual with a disability to try to determine what works for that specific individual in terms of a reasonable accommodation. Another example of a promising practice for reasonable accommodation is a process for reviewing reasonable accommodation decisions where necessary. For example, if reasonable accommodation request is denied and posting the policies and procedures and providing reasonable accommodations on an accessible website in public areas and including them in written out outreach materials 
so that folks are familiar with the specific policies. So these are examples of promising practices with respect to providing reasonable accommodations. In addition, providing uh, reasonable modifications of policies, practices, and procedures. An example of a policy promising practice is quite similar. Covered entities having a written policy explaining their obligation to make reasonable modifications to policies, practices, and procedures to ensure equal opportunity. Next slide, please. So let's talk briefly about uh, additional examples of promising practices for administration of programs in the most integrated setting. So an example, for, ex for example, covered entity staff do not automatically refer all job seekers with disabilities to a state VR program, but make individual case-by-case -case determinations regarding eligibility. Covered entities administer programs so that individuals with disabilities have access to the full range of services available to all customers. And covered entities ensure that individuals with disabilities, including individuals with significant disabilities, are provided services that lead to competitive integrated employment. These are examples of promising practices in terms of the administration of programs in the most integrated setting. Next slide, please. So let's talk briefly about examples of promising practices in terms of effective communication. I expect many of you are familiar with those. For individuals who are deaf and hard of hearing, effective communication may include the use of the following auxiliary aids, devices, and strategies. Qualified interpreters on site or through video remote interpreting services, real-time computer-aided transcription services, open and closed captioning, including real-time captioning, voice, text, and video-based telecommunications products and systems, including TTYs, video phones, and caption telephones are equally effective telecommunications devices, and video text displays. These are examples of promising practices to provide effective communication for individuals who are deaf and hard of hearing. Next slide, please. And finally, uh, with respect to uh, effective communication. For individuals who are blind or visually impaired, effective communication may include the use of the following auxiliary aids, devices, and strategies. Qualified readers, tape texts, audio recordings, braille materials and displays, screen reader software, magnification software, optical readers, secondary audio programs, and large print materials. Next slide, please. So for my last slide, uh, we're looking at examples of promising practices for architectural and information and communication technology accessibility. Architectural accessibility, as we all know, is very important to provide access for individuals, particularly with physical disabilities. So how can that be done? Some examples of promising practices include equal opportunity officers, or similar situated individuals who are involved from the beginning of any physical site planning and technology acquisitions to ensure equal access and opportunity for individuals with disabilities. As many of us know, it's always less expensive to plan ahead and provide architectural access in the planning stage rather than having to go back and retrofit um, existing buildings once they're built. Another example of a promising practice is staff involved in site planning and program development being trained in the equal opportunity and access requirements of Section 188. And finally, covered entities that make technology accessible. And that's my last slide, and I'll turn it back over to Michael or Ora. Thank you. Thanks, Lee, and thank you for, for sharing so many examples that come out of the guide and a, a, a great, uh, great infomercial for, for people. Hopefully they, they will uh, 
uh, uh, look at the guide and, and use it in, in both design of programs and also evaluating sort of their baseline of where they are uh, related to the AJCs and the workforce development system as a whole. Um, for added perspective, let me turn to Laura now with uh, ETA and uh, you provide us some perspectives on uh, 188. Great. Thank you, Michael. Next slide, please. Thank you, Wade, for providing us with some examples of promising practices that may be considered by the American Job Centers, AJCs, and others to ensure universal access to programs and activities for all customers, including those with disabilities. It's a pleasure to be a part of this discussion panel today, so thank you again for having me. Um, as the Unit Chief for the Departments of Labor's Employment and Training Administration, Specialty National Programs Unit, um, which falls under the Office of Workforce Investment, our goal is to provide national leadership oversight, policy guidance, and technical assistance to the workforce investment system authorized under WIOA. To carry out this work, the department collaborates with others, um, including federal agencies and folks at the state and local governments. Today, my goal is to explain why the Section 188 Resource Guide matters to ETA. And second, I wanted to give you all an update of where we are with WIOA. And lastly, I'll cover what are some available technical assistance resources and guidance that we have. Next slide, please. Actually, we can just go back to the previous one. One more thing. <laughs> Thank you. WIOA aims to ensure that federal investments in employment and training programs are evidence-based and data-driven and accountable to participants and taxpayers. Therefore, more than ever, this is a time for the entire workforce system to renew their focus on making sure all American job centers and all services are accessible for and work for everyone, including people with disabilities. One way for the department to promote accountability and transparency across the system is to release resources such as the Section 8 Section 188 Resource Guide to make sure that AJCs and other WIOA-funded programs are physically and programmatically accessible and are customer-centered designed to deliver high-quality workforce services to all customers, including people with disabilities. We know this is a transition year. We also know some states and local areas have already implemented some of the practices that Lee highlighted in his presentation. We're also aware that Disability Employment Initiative, um, the states that have received funding, which is a joint initiative between ETA and ODA, um, are already leading some of this work in their states, including person center integrated resource teams. Next slide, please. So this slide here gives you an idea of where we are with WIOA. There's different technical there's different training and employment guidance letters, um, TEGLs and TENS here that you'll notice. So what I wanted to highlight about this specific slide is that WIOA statute is in effect. To date, there has been about 26 TENS and TEGLs under the new public law that have been released. The regulations have been proposed and the public has made comments. The comment period has closed and we are currently reviewing comments and working on a final rule to publish in 2016. Until the final rule is published, our regulations are not in effect. However, ETA has published a series of operating guidance that you can see here, and this slide only highlights a few. Again, I'd like to mention that there have been 26 tens and Teagles that have been issued under WIOA. I also wanted to point out that some of these guidances have been developed in partnership with other federal agencies, including with Department of Education. So until the final rule is published, ETA grantees can rely on these guidance letters until um, that's out and available. So let me walk through some of these tens and teagles here just to give you an idea of what they are. The first one, Teagle 1914, lays out the vision of the WIOA and provides an overview of upcoming guidance and technical assistance to support effective implementation of WIOA. 
Teagle 3714 provides information regarding the prohibitions of discrimination based on gender identity, gender expression, and sex stereotyping. This Teagle and related attachments explain the legal authority for these obligations, give some examples of prohibited discrimination, and suggest ways to prevent, identify, and address discrimination. Teagle 0315, this guidance also includes clarification and flexibilities on using these funds and guidance to states for making sub-state allocations with adult, youth, and dislocated worker formula funds. Teagle 115, um, this guidance addresses the state status of such waivers during program year 2015 when most provisions of WIOA go into effect. This guidance also communicates ETA's positional waivers under WIOA. Teagle 415 lays out the vision for the one-stop delivery system, also known as the American Job Centers, under WIOA and links to key technical assistance resources to support states and local areas. Next slide, please. So um, let's see, it's been over a year since WIOA has been made into public law, and since then, there are two resources that I do want to highlight where you can find additional TA efforts. Um, let's see, for wioa.workforce31.org, there you can find Quick Start Action Planners, information about how to design your programs to make sure that they're customer-centered designed. Also, you can find out about peer learning opportunities convening for state and local teams. This slide showcases just a few of what we've created so far. One of the course offerings focuses on customer-centered design, which is a course that some states started in July. ETA has also established a WIOA resource page that can be found at dolelta.gov backslash WIOA. This website here provides information and resources for states, local areas, and nonprofits and other grantees and other stakeholders to assist with implementing the Act. It contains information about and links to proposed rules, guidance, frequently asked questions, and other TA materials. This page is constantly being updated with new guidance and new TA materials as they become available. In addition to working with the National Disability Institute and through the Disability Employment Initiative, I also wanted to highlight that ODEP's LEAD Center is providing TA in several areas relating to WIOA from a disability perspective, such as this webinar that we're having today, and covers topics such as providing service to people with significant disabilities through the AG, AJCs and Section 188. Thank you again for participating on this webinar. Your work is essential in helping us build a prepared and competitive workforce. So it's been a pleasure to be on this webinar. Thank you, Laura. And uh, again, um, I think what's so important and what we, we, we want people to walk away from this webinar today is uh, the, the multiple parts of Department of Labor, CRC, Center, uh, Civil Rights Center, uh, the um, ETA, Employment and Training Administration, and ODEP work together to get a aligned vision uh, to um, put together the 188 uh, Disability uh, Resource Guide and uh, uh, really we'll continue to work together where a lot of these TEGLs and, and TENs uh, uh, further operationalize what, what this is all about. But let's take it down another level. Let's take it into the state or into the states, and we we want to share with you the work Lead Center has been doing with the Missouri, with the Missouri Equal Opportunity Practice Network. And so um, let me let me turn it over. Uh, first, you're going to hear from folks uh, uh, with Lead Center. You're going to hear from Lisa, uh, and then you're going to hear from uh, our colleagues and collaborators in I guess pronounced right Missouri. Okay, Lisa, take it away. Okay, thank you, Michael. Um, I was actually hoping that uh, Michael Holmes could give a little introduction, but I think since we started a little bit late, we're just going to bring it all together. I'll give you some information about what LEAD did uh, in terms of working with Missouri and working through the 188 guide, and then we will hear from Danielle, uh, Danielle Smith, who is the fabulous, fabulous 
State Lead EO Officer, and then we will let Michael Holmes bring us home with um, how Missouri is handling um, all of the new legislation and really taking an incredibly proactive approach. So, Michael, I know you can't hear me, but I hope you're okay with that. So next slide, please. So the goal of a practice network was really just to incorporate um, learn how to incorporate strategies for being for being successful for bringing people with disabilities as a broad universal audience into the generic workforce system. Um, Michael will I'm sure mention this, but we met at the NASWA conference last year and we talked about just doing something that would be very innovative to see how we can get this information in the 188 guide to states, to local areas, to regions to have them start using it. Um, and again, I'm not going to go over all of the um, different pieces of 188 because we have um, already discussed that, but the focus of this was to use 188 as a blueprint to basically just improve access. Next slide, please. So we, just, we put together this pilot or practice network using 188 as a blueprint and focused on disability really because disability, as I'm sure most people on this phone know, cuts across every area that would be touched by EO. It, it cross, cuts across race, age, gender, sexual orientation, gender identity, ethnicity, religion, everything, every possible corner of, of the world and of people coming into the one-stop system Disability can cut across that. It's also the only minority group that anyone, any one of us can join at any time. So therefore, if we are focusing our efforts on how to work best with people with disabilities, we will then be focusing our efforts on how to work best with all customers. Next slide, please. So within the workforce system, again, disability cutting across, job seekers with disabilities, whether or not they are disclosing, they are accessing the general workforce system in every possible program that is available. So long-term unemployed, w, well, WIA, WIOA, adult and dislocated worker, TANF, veteran services, seniors, youth, limited English proficient, every single possible program is actually touched by people with disabilities. Next slide, please. So what we did was we went into Missouri and really talked with the Workforce Investment Board to say, you need to let us know what is it that you need. Here is the, here's the pilot. We can take 188 and figure out anything that we want to do with it, um, ensuring that the goals that, 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 they, that we come up with are based on the evidence of need and that we can ensure at least one state initiative was being tied into the outcomes because the goal was not to go in and do something different, do something extra. It was really to help the state figure out what they were doing, how things could be tied together, and again, with the overlay of 188. Next slide, please. So the first thing we did, and this is what I was hoping Michael would talk about, but I'll talk about it, was we wanted to take the pulse. The, the entire state and, and the, um, the directors up at the state, the regional WIB directors, really didn't want to make a decision without hearing from staff, which was really, really fabulous. So we decided the first step was to take the pulse of the AJC staff to determine the areas of greatest need, suggestions for improvement, and evidence of success. So what we did was we put together a participation, um, let, let us know what you think type of questionnaire, and sent this information, sent, sent a very quick um, survey out to all Anyone who is working within the workforce system, touching the workforce system as an employee, it doesn't have to be an employee of the state, it could be anyone that is working in the AJC. Next slide, please. So what we did was we broke it down in terms of it, the basic sections of 188 that Chris Button talked about earlier. So we looked at basic demographic information. We just wanted to know, and this, and this, this survey was absolutely anonymous. We wanted to find out where they work, what career center best represents the location. If they're not in a location, where are they? And we made it very easy with a drop-down menu. We also wanted to know what role best describes their current duties. Next slide. Um, in section two, we also wanted to look at, we, we pulled apart each piece of 188 and basically just wanted to know how are we doing. So in terms of understanding local needs, we gave some examples of what that would look like and then asked people to say, are they doing very well, okay, good, what, what, how was everything working for, 
for the centers. And then we specifically, and this is the piece that, I, that is just has been fabulous, we asked for evidence of success and suggestions. So we didn't just want to know, okay, yes, we're doing well, or no, we're not. Tell us what we're doing well, and then tell us if we're not a suggestion, and even if we are, a suggestion you would have for improvement. All examples used throughout the survey, again, were all used for illustrative purposes, but they were taken directly from the 188 guide. Next slide. Please. Um, and same thing, I don't, we can go to the next slide because this was just pulling in the rest of, um, of 188. So in terms of the, of the survey highlights, what was really fabulous is that there were 451 unique views and almost a 68% conversion rate. So that's, for surveys, that's, that's really great. So this was something that we were able to show, to this, show back to the state to show every single region was, was represented in providing information um, to move forward. Next slide. This basically shows, again, just the, the makeup of all of the different centers within each of the different regions. Next slide. And then this also now talk, talks about, it shows which positions were, um, which positions, what, which positions people had when they took the, the survey. So we had almost every single position you could imagine, career center staff, workforce investment board, directors, we had LVERs and DVOPs, we had training instructors, we had career counselors, some that were full-time staff and some that weren't. 89% were full-time, they worked in the center five days a week, 6% worked in the centers one to four days a week, and 5% were less than one day per week. Next slide. So what we did was we pulled all of the information together and all of the categories in the survey really represented the overall goal of universal access. So we talked about marketing, training and orientation, accommodating job seekers, and then again, really focused on the comments. So there was a lot of very interesting information that came back. Um, and I really just want to go over the comments because that's really what's mo most important. Training, and some of this was not new because this is the case in almost every AJC across the country probably. People want training. You know, that there's you can only train so much and you can only do so much, but people whenever possible wanted in-person training. And, and one of the comments that was really terrific that we were able to take back was someone talked about a recent training that was done on transgender popul on the transgender population and how that training was incredibly impactful. So that information was able to go back so that we can know moving forward, how was that impactful? Let's, let's see if we can use the same model. Another thing that was, um, that was discussed by, more, by quite a number of people was that the EO tagline, whereas it's on all material, it can be overlooked. So there were suggestions from staff, maybe bold, bold type, different color or font, make it, make it stand out. And then, of course, there were challenges that were um, identified and ideas, for, um, ideas and suggestions. But some of the challenges that came out, and again, this was from staff, was to, um, and this was in different locations, examine front desk counter height, ensure access buttons are on the door, target marketing rather than, than it being accidental marketing, um, hold monthly regular community workshops and community partnerships, do additional cross-training with vocational rehabilitation. There was something mentioned about one region that had something called an Energizer Job Club that was really helpful, and now that's going to become a promising practice with, throughout the state with others. So it really, we were able to get a lot of amazing, amazing information, again, that came from the state and that, or from the staff, which was really what was important for, for step one. Next slide. So now I'm going to turn it over to now my very good friend, Danielle. Uh, Danielle, who is the um, EO officer for the state, and she will give you a little information about the next steps that Missouri is going to take based on um, the detailed information that they have from that survey. Thanks, Lisa. And I just want to thank the LEAD Center for letting Lisa work with the state of Missouri with implementing these um, pilot initiatives. But our next step for Missouri, we would like to get the customer and the employer's uh, perceptions on what they need from the workforce system. So we plan to send out a questionnaire to those who have participated in our system in the last six months. For job seekers, we're going to ask questions like, did you disclose a disability to a staff member in our job center? And if so, did you request accommodation? That way we can get a feel if our customers are being serviced the way they should in our centers. 
And for employers, we want to get a feel of what they are needing. So we're going to ask questions like, does your company have a diversity policy that includes disability? And we'll ask questions like, does your company have an accommodation process in place for applicants and employees? We are also in the process of updating and implementing um, a new our, our policy on service notes and, ca and case notes, and we are hoping to have a trainer trainer. We would like to have lead assist us with training our local EO officers, um, with training the local staff on what is an appropriate case note or service note um, when servicing customers in our center. And then from the results of the uh, questionnaire, there were a lot of questions about training on um, hidden disabilities. So we're hoping that the LEAD Center will be able to assist us with developing some training on identifying hidden disabilities for our job seekers. And that's all I have. Next slide. So now we're hopefully turning it over to Michael. Michael Holmes, who's going to bring us home and talk about the WIB perspective and also a, a, an amazing local example that the state put together. Well, first of all, thank you, Lisa, oh, there we go. for your uh, your help and, and what you're doing with the state of Missouri. Uh, like Lisa said earlier, we met at the um, national meeting for CRC, and she was mentioning the LEAD Institute, and at that time I was state president, and I walked, walked up to her and said, yes, we want to be a part of this. We want, to, we want you to come into Missouri. And uh, I believe in really partnership development. And so in order to make that happen, we had to bring in uh, of our 14 regions, all of our executive directors and our state to make sure what I was asking for, they were in support of. And I went immediately back to my local workforce board and the mayor and said, well, what we're going to do is create a disabilities committee. Uh, so we created that disabilities committee and it became, it was first only my board and um, our EO officer. And we were talking about how do we work with the companies that we work with currently. And out of that came from board members, you know, from companies to saying, well, you know what, we really don't know everything about it. We're trying to do this work, but maybe a conference. And we were like, a conference? And they were like, can you all put together, and it could just be a half day. And the board members, uh, which are our business, the business sector, we have one of our largest employer, employers of our state, which is our health care system, uh, BJC. He said, I will be a part of it. I will chair it. Along with Job Corps, we will put everything together. So we came up with this Accommodation for Success uh, program. And then we opened it up not only to our region, uh, but we opened it up to our, the two closest, re three closest regions to St. Louis, in the St. Louis City, St. Louis County, Jeff Frank, and uh, we also went over to Illinois to Mad uh, uh, Madison County and St. Clair County and said, well, we're going to have this task force. Can you all volunteer to put this one-day conference, half-day conference on? And we target employers only because uh, the number one issue was, employers, HR people didn't know everything and they wanted to have a discussion. So uh, we had breakout sessions and all this was done by committee that started in the local web, the disabilities committee, and it got to be where the whole region, uh, the other four WIB start saying, well, how can we be a part of it? So. Uh, the breakout sessions was recruiting adequate, sourcing uh, to find talent, accommodation and assistance technology, and tax credit. So we had our commissioner, we have a commissioner that is responsible for disabilities for the entire city. So we had him to be a part of this. And we had other uh, guest speakers who volunteered, a voc rehab, um, uh, the blind community volunteered to say, we'll staff it, we'll do the workshop. So uh, next slide, please. Uh, then we got our mayor involved because whatever we do, we like to know, okay, mayor, this is going to be a change agent. Well, what do you feel about it? And so um, 
the one thing he thought was it's great when we, we, we deal with clients each and every day. But when we start and we know our clients could be business, but when we deal with residents, we wanted to say this is going to be focusing on the business client and really trying to get them more engaged to understand this uh, the disabilities community and how they should be hiring and how we can integrate this, not to do something different, but to integrate this into what they do each and every day. And so the mayor gave us a quote, and, uh, you know, we had a press release. We had uh, uh, he went out and talked about it with, with some of our business leaders. And so the business community, that, that was his quote. And then, of course, we wanted to make sure that this was a practical way for the business community to get together and talk about it and know the resources that was available to them on the local level, on the regional level, and on the state level. Because we believe sometimes they know all of this, but the private business really don't know. They're taking it uh, bit by bit. And so what we wanted to say is, okay, we're going to be that source for you of information. And you can connect to all these people. We had Lisa who gave the uh, keynote, keynote address, and people was thrilled about it, what she had to say. And they thought it was one. We had 100 business that registered for this. Probably of that 100 that registered, we had close to 80 that actually showed, and some showed that did not register, and they're still talking about this uh, half-day conference today. Their uh, companies are saying when we see them, oh, my God, my person said it was great. Uh, you all need to do something different next year. What are you all looking at? And now the committee, we have formed the Disabilities Committee, which our your officer is the staff on it, and we have board members that run it. They meet every single month to talk about how do we interact, how do we engage, how do we do professional development with staff, because I know staff want to do better, but their issue, I don't want it to be a, I got you. I want them to be comfortable enough to deal with this as they deal with it each and every day with, with, with our clients and be able to provide the best possible service. So I think the more we educate our staff on um, that this is no different than what you do every day, but just be aware of what you're doing and, and some of the services uh, providers that you can call on to deliver these services. And I think we can be become a better system. Next slide, please. So that's uh, all we have to say. We think it's a great program. Uh, we're, we're just taking baby steps, but the um, – Accommodation Success uh, half-day conference was a huge success of, of us coming out of the door with this program. So we are committed to it, and our staff is working hard on it. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Michael. Uh, and uh, again, I, I think uh, what you're doing in Missouri, both uh, at a state level and then in St. Louis, is exactly the kind of activities we'd love to see uh, taking place across the country. And I think you've given people some insight and perspective uh, about uh, how you went about working with the different parts of uh, a community. And, and uh, uh, there, there's great, great opportunity to think about replication across the country. We have a few minutes, not very long, but we're going to try to get a few questions in. Uh, I'm going to go to the first question, next slide, uh, and, and ask uh, Lee, personally, um, since you're the representative on, on this panel from the Civil Rights Center, how do you see the 188 guide helping states in implementing we always knew disability-related provisions? Thank you, Michael. I, you know, the Section 188 reference guide, as I had said earlier, is a wonderful resource uh, for covered entities and others regarding ways in which uh, they can apply promising practices and other ideas to ensure the inclusion and equal opportunity for individuals with disabilities. You know, it's really a great tool and it covers so many different topics and issues that any individual just picking it up can come up with interesting and innovative ideas about ways to, to better include people with disabilities um, in 
the uh, AJCs and in the one-stop system and uh, within the workforce investment system in general. It really is a, a terrific tool. I've, you know, as you know, I've been working on the, this area for many, many years. And even so, as I read through the Section 188 Reference Guide, I was reminded of things that I had long forgotten about in terms of innovative ways to provide increased accessibility for people with disabilities. And at the end of the day, that's a lot of what WIOA is uh, for individuals with disabilities, giving them an opportunity to participate just like their peers in the work in the workforce investment system um, and to be able to access the same services um, as their as anybody else um, and have the same success as anybody else in terms of finding employment opportunities. Thanks. Thanks, Lee. Let's go to the next question, question number two. And question number two is, how can this guide be used to inform the development of what is the next stage of WIOA, uh, and that is state and local plan development? Um, how could this guide be used to inform professional development efforts? Uh, I'm going to ask several of you this question, but Lisa, you you have worked at a state level and you've worked at a local level inside uh, 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 an AJC. Um, what's your thoughts on, on how the guide might be used to, to help develop state and local plans? Well, my first thought was I'm glad I didn't hang up because I didn't know I was getting a question. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, one of the best ways is really the way that we did it in Missouri. It was really taking a look at the guide, seeing what, as Lee said, there are some amazing examples, but you really need to figure out what your what the guide is is talking about, but then what is actually happening happening, and to be able to do what we're doing in Missouri to not only poll staff but also poll and look at people who job seekers who are who are accessing the system and have accessed the system within the past six months and also employers. That's really the way that you're going to be able to figure out if what you're doing or what you're even thinking about doing is going to be meaningful. And so much of what we've done in Missouri is going to be able to inform the, um, well, actually going back to the last question, able, being able to um, inform the plans that um, each, that Missouri, but as every state is going to have to submit to DOL, it really just, um, it lets you know what's happening, where it's happening, and what people need to make it continue to happen. Okay, and, and Laura, uh, I wonder, I know you're new to ETA, and ETA is the home of who manages the, where these plans are going to come into. Uh, any thoughts about the guide reference in, in, as, a, as a resource related to future state plan development? We lose, we lose Laura, or she's got her mute button. All right, we'll 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 move on in the interest of of time. I want to go uh, uh, to question number four. If you move the slides, question number four, um, and this is back to the Missouri example. How did the idea for the Accommodation for Success conference come about? And, and what did you learn for the event that might help other states considering employer engagement activities? And, and uh, anyone want to try to take that? I'll take that. Mike Holmes from St. Louis. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it came about uh, through the, like I said, the, uh, we have a disabilities committee that we formed uh, six months ago um, when we met Lisa, and we came back and formed a disability committee with our board members for the public workforce system. Um, and out of that meeting, and we had, of course, our business leaders were on that committee, and they are the ones that brought it forward to say, you know, since we have this disabilities committee, 
is it something we can do to help HR officers understand what their role should be and how they could work and who are the right people to connect to? So it came from the business community, and what we learned from this is anytime you are engaged with the business community and you take what they are saying and you put it into action, they support you. Uh, and we had not only our business community support, but our state, uh, like vocational vo uh, rehab, we had the uh, blind community. All of them funded this project and said, hey, we'll put this. We can do this. If you do this, we can do this. So it was really uh, uh, from within the organization, within the committee that the uh, it came, the idea came out, and we helped just make sure that ideal became reality, and we worked on it every month. And so now they, they are seeing that, wow, an idea we had made reality, what can we do next? Great. And let's go to question six. Um, and that question is, what advice do you have for state and local workforce development boards to improve access and equal opportunity per Section 188 requirements and advance inclusive career services and pathways. Um, uh, anyone want to take that? Although um, maybe Lee, you might start out from a CRC perspective. Um, what's your thoughts? Uh, you know, I think the Missouri example is, is a terrific one. As Lisa pointed out, it's very important to um, assess what the current status is in regarding the uh, accessibility and inclusion of people with disabilities before you start to plan about what you can do. You know, as Michael Holmes had really talked about, it really is very helpful to, to set up a committee to, to really focus on issues. So many times people with disabilities get lost in the process. You know, there are lots of responsibilities that the AJCs and covered entities have in terms of who they serve, and sometimes people with disabilities just are not always the priority. So I think in terms of making them the priority, you know, setting up a specific initiative to, to call out and say that you're going to focus on it and just making people think about it, you know, as, as a starting point is really very important. I think that's the first step in compliance is really focusing on the issues. It's easy to pull out the 188 guide and go through it and think about how specific promising practices affect you know, your local workforce investment system. But it's really making the issue of priority that's the harder first step. And once you take those steps, I think that's really the pathway to, to really meaningfully including individuals with disabilities in the workforce investment system and helping them be real and valuable and equal participants in that system where they have the same opportunities to utilize their resources and gain the same outcomes as their peers. Well, and, and this is Lisa. I will also say that one of the things um, Michael did after, you know, really kind of going back and thinking about 188 and what it means is they put together part of their, um, I think it's a monthly meeting, so if, correct me if I'm wrong, but they made sure that EO yeah, and disability was on their agenda every month, which it had been before in, in, in other pieces, but it wasn't its own category. And I think that was something that really helped the state kind of say, okay, what is it that we're doing? And how is that, how can we do things that will um, cross all, all populations? And then the other thing um, that I know Danielle has done as part of as being the state lead for EO is now that, that they've really started to take a good look, each month or each quarter, each of the EO officers that are assigned by region, because that's how they do it in Missouri, but they need to bring something to the table each month, either what they've done and then possibly how to, how to take that idea that worked in one region and move it to another. So it really has just become a much, well, I can't say it's become because they're incredible people and incredibly inclusive, but the process has become just so much more proactively inclusive, and I think that's, that's really the key. 
And, and Lisa, you're right. One thing I would say to workforce groups and regions, you know, this can't be a, I got you, a beat up on you, we got you now. It has to really be an education and a service that you do each and every day. That's why when we came back, we said, no, let's do a survey of all of our staff just to see where they are and where they think they are and then be able to say, okay, this is the roadmap. And so I think once you do it and it's uh, truly integrated and you talk about we're going through this together, it's not a I got you. And I think on our monthly meetings that we have, we have a meeting with DWD, our workforce development, and all over the regions every month. And what we try to do is say, you know, it can't always be you didn't do. It's Let's give you technical assistance. Let's give your staff technical assistance. What can we do to help? And the state has opened their hearts on this to us. And like I said, it wasn't this way when we started because I had to get, uh, get everybody to agree to let this organization lead come in and direct us and give and be a partner, not just telling us what to do, what the law say. Everybody can read the law. But how do you really integrate this? And I think once you do that and people see that you're really trying to work with them and not trying to catch them and you're really trying to educate them, I think everybody will come aboard. But it takes time. It's not easy. We still have struggles. Fantastic. Well said, Michael. All right, quickly, uh, you get each a sound bite. Uh, it needs to be one word or ten or, or stream of consciousness. You say Section 188. What's your message, uh, Lee, to the audience? Uh, ten words or less. Contact lead. Contact lead center. Okay. <laughs> uh, Lisa, ten words or less. What What about Section 188? It's not that hard. It's not that hard. Michael, I think you already said it. It's it's, it's collaboration, and it's not I got gotcha, you, right? Correct. All right. And Chris Button, what would you say? Well, Lisa said it earlier. Roadmap. Blueprint for change. Blueprint for change. Danielle, are you still there? Yes, I am. Universal <laughs> access. Universal access. Fantastic. Uh, and this Laura, is Laura. Hey. could you hear me? Yes, oh, great. I can hear you now. Yes, uh, you can finally great. hear me. Just yes. two things I want to stress. It's, uh, it's really about providing excellent customer service to all customers, and it's about promoting continuous improvement, just as Michael was stressing. Thank you. Fantastic. Let's thank all our panelists. Uh, wonderful uh, presentations and dialogue. Uh, you can connect with the LEAD Center. Uh, if we go to the last slide, sign up for LEAD Center News. Sign up on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube. Uh, visit our website, www.leadcenter.org. You will see archived all four parts of WIOA from a disability perspective. Um, this was uh, a, a really strong dialogue. We so often think about 188 compliance, compliance, compliance. Instead, what we heard about is collaboration, uh, alignment of values, open communication, working together uh, at all levels, national, state, and local. Uh, and fundamentally, this is what we're learning today. It's not just about people with disabilities. The stretch and reach of 188 is across all people with multiple barriers, vulnerable people uh, trying to get back or, or into the workforce for the first time and uh, find their career pathway. So thank you for joining us, and we hope uh, you'll visit with us uh, at uh, leadcenter.org. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Bye-bye.